My name is Melissa Fulton. I'm the CEO of the Lake County Chamber of Commerce, and we have some of our board members here this evening. Uh, to my left, Lisa Wilson and Bobby Dutcher, both directors on the chamber, and then our president, Joe Castile, is in the back bringing out more chairs because you've been so gracious to show up and we have more than we had chairs set up. So, uh, our process is that uh, we have received some questions. I have a total of 15 questions and then one was submitted this evening. You are welcome to use the notepads on the table in the rear to write out questions. Give them to Lisa or Bobby. They have a list of the already uh, predetermined questions uh, because we don't want to duplicate. The, uh, normally we do a, co a coin toss to determine which candidate goes first, but Mo, being the gentleman he is, said ladies first, so Julia will be doing her introductory statement to begin with. Uh, and then our process is that we alternate. And once they have each made their opening statement, then we will go into the predetermined questions, if you will. Um, our timekeeper is Danielle Saperis and uh, Chuck Saberna, another one of our chamber directors. And the opening statements being two minutes, when the time of one minute, 30 seconds has elapsed, Danielle will hold up a yellow paper to let the candidate know that they only have 30 seconds left. When their time is up, she will hold up a red paper. So that's what that's all about. I used to do that, but it's too hard for me, so I don't do that anymore. Okay, so uh, at this point, and uh, videotaping for this evening, uh, as he is for all of the candidates forum, forums, is Sam Houston with Houston Productions. So we really appreciate, appreciate his assistance. And as I recall, um, are we live streaming we tonight? Live streaming. We are live streaming, and then this will be shown on PEG Channel, and eventually it will be on YouTube. So if you missed something or you didn't, uh, you want to hear what went on last Monday night when we did the district, um, which one did I do? One, 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 one. Oh, I did <laughs> district four with Tina Scott, um, and Chris Allmine, uh, you will be able to find that as well. And Sam's reminding me it's available as this one will be on the County of Lake Facebook page. So at this time, I would like to introduce our candidates, incumbent District 1 Supervisor Moke Simon, and candidate Julia Mary Bono, both are residents of Middletown. And at this point, uh, Mary will, excuse me, Julia will begin with her opening statement. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, well, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for coming tonight. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and meet some new people, I hope, after the event. Uh, my name is Julia Bono, and I have lived and operated small businesses in District 1 for 20 years. Um, you can read about my professional qualifications and platform at my website, uh, bono4, the number 4, supervisor.com. So I'll instead address why I decided to run for supervisor tonight. My vision for Lake County embraces healthy people, strong families, good schools, respect for elders, decent housing, and work that dignifies individuals within a cohesive, inclusive, and caring society. I also have compassionate concern for the welfare of all sentient beings and for environmental conservation. Furthermore, as an ethical person, I pledge to work towards eliminating corruption in Lake County as it appears. Our county also faces numerous problems that needed solving yesterday within an overall long-term strategy for economic rehabilitation and development that is absolutely essential for the welfare of our residents. As Einstein once said, problems cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. 
our county's past leaders were largely thinking in ways that created the very challenges we now face. So a real change is needed to address key issues effectively, strategically, and intelligently. My experience as a leader in various nonprofits has taught me to think beyond my own interests to those of the community of people I lead and serve. I take a long-term strategic view that accommodates the wishes of those I represent and I pause to assess the impact of my decisions on present and future generations before taking action. As your supervisor, I intend to use my intelligence and well-developed skills in problem solving, systems analysis, financial prudence, and strategic planning to take Lake County forward into a new and more prosperous era. I aim to fully le leverage the benefits of modern technology while also preserving our country's beautiful rural setting for posterity. I therefore ask you to vote for me to intelligently plan for and implement the constructive change Lake County deserves. Thank you, and thank you. Um, since Julia ran over, we will um, afford Moak another 30 seconds for his opening statement. And I neglected to remind everyone, please put your cell phones on silent. Thank you. Moak. Excellent. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Moak Simon. I'm running for District 1 Supervisor or to be elected again for District 1 Supervisor here in South Lake County um, for a second term. Born and raised here. I was born in the um, Redbud Hospital. I uh, went to high school here in Little Town High School. I went on to play uh, some college football, a little bit in the NFL. A local boy here that grew up. Um, as far as a uh, community member, uh, I'm a member of the Middletown Rancheria of Pomo Indians of California. Our large business, which sits outside of town, is the Twin Pine Casino and Hotel. Uh, throughout my career, once I was done playing football, I came back and became a leader of our tribal nation. Over 20 years, I've served there as a tribal leader, building jobs and opportunities here locally for our people that are in our surrounding communities. And I also have been coaching at the, at the Middletown High School, the Middletown Mustangs. In 2015, the Valley Fire hit our area. It was uh, one of the most devastating days we'd had in my lifetime that I can remember. And continuously, year after year, we've had incidents of the same catastrophic events. So in 2015, when I heard that uh, Jim Comstock was not gonna run for re-election, I decided to step up as a community member to run for office. And when I did that, I made a commitment to uh, work diligently on economic development, education opportunities, general welfare of the public as um, you know, each household, uh, look at an opportunity to rebrand and bring a new face to Lake County. I came and I ran as a change. The first Native American elected in the history of the county, and now the first Native American to be the Board of Supervisors Chair. So I couldn't carry that honor any <laughs> prouder. I will work diligently to be available, to work through problems and have solutions. I put in my um, Simon 4 District 1 Supervisor is where I do my Gmail. I have a Vote for Moak uh, website. Um, and I continue to try and work diligently uh, every day on problems. As you know, running for office and being in office is two different things. I see there are some local folks that serve on city councils and on the Board of Supervisors here. Problem solutions sometimes take longer than you want. But as you work through the government and you learn the opportunities and the, way, the people to talk to, you can come up with long-term solutions. Proud to say in the time that I've sat on the board, we've came up with a 10-year economic development plan for 2028. Is that my extra 30 seconds? No. All right, just checking. Um, but I'm here again to ask for your vote. Hopefully I've done the work over the past three years to put myself in a position to keep moving forward and to help this county move forward. So please, vote for Moak, and that's what I'm here for. Thank you very much. All right, we'll start our questions for this evening. The first question goes to Julia. 15% of total parcels in the county have a tax delinquency, totaling $18.3 million due to the county and various special districts. This problem is particularly bad in the city of Clear Lake with 25% delinquent properties and over 2,000 properties in the city of Clear Lake eligible for sale. What should the Board of Supervisors be doing to address this problem? 
Um, I am aware of this issue, and I understand that the Board of Supervisors has taken action to accelerate collections. Um, I hesitate somewhat because I once was in the position of uh, being responsible for a property that was being about to be sold by the county at auction. Uh, we had had a dispute over the property taxes being owed or not owed, and it ended up at the point where we were forced to sell the property at a great loss. And so I have compassion for those who may be struggling, perhaps as a result of the fire or a result of failed businesses due to the fires. Um, it's a little harder to justify in Clear Lake, perhaps, but certainly in Middletown, in Anderson Springs, in Cobb, in other areas that were heavily hit by the Valley Fire, um, I can understand if some people were not able to get themselves back on their feet in order to pay their taxes. Um, so I would like to look at things on more of a case-by-case -case basis, but certainly where those properties have simply been abandoned, we need to accelerate collection. Thank you. Milk. Thank you. I think I know where that question came from. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what we've done at the Board of Supervisors, obviously, we understand. When I came on the board, this was a long-standing issue. Some of these properties have been out there for 20 years, uh, you know, some of them. And so what we've done at the Board of Supervisors, obviously, when I first came on board, we accelerated having our uh, tax sales through the, the tax collector's office. At least we had one. Now, it was only for um, a few homes, obviously. I think it was 150 to 200 homes. And so what we need to do is look at innovative ideas, how we can accelerate the tax sales, move through those properties, and start to get those things on a regular basis. We're currently working on that with the tax collector's office and an ad hoc committee that was put together as a board, which I was a part of in the beginning. And now Rob Brown and um, Bruno Sebtier are gonna bring back solutions and opportunities to the county. It seems like a simple issue, but it's a long-standing process that has a lot of rules, it has to go through an elected office, and we're gonna continue to work on that in a solution that hopefully will speed those things up. Thank you. Our next question goes to Moak. District 1 is normally viewed as representing Middletown and Hid Hidden Valley, but Lower Lake and a significant portion of Clear Lake are also within the district. What actions would you take to be more of an advocate on the board for the city of Clear Lake? The south side of Clear Lake, yes, it, it is in my district. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting way that it's set up. District 2, obviously, is Bruno Sabatier's area. We kind of share a little bit of the South District. Being available for opportunities when folks call. I've worked with folks on the RV side um, of the lake. Um, as far as the south side of Clear Lake, um, most of the issues I've got are situations that we have during rainfall through special districts. Uh, paying attention to those, and then working with business owners over there are Valley Glass, some other folks that are on there, making sure that they have a voice and an opportunity to come to me in issues and being available for them. Thank you. Julia. Uh, well, first of all, um, I would very much like to hear from the constituents in, in Lower Lake and in Lower Clear Lake. Um, I think that having regular meetings, say, at, at, you know, I just attended a meeting recently with uh, Congressman um, uh, Mike Thompson at the local coffee shop in Middletown. I thought that was an excellent idea, getting together with people, having a little coffee, and starting to talk about the issues that are relevant to you. Um, I also believe in the leveraging of modern technology, such as uh, Facebook Messenger, such as, um, you know, uh, website messenger services, so that people can actually uh, easily communicate with me uh, via text or email um, if they have an issue and then be you know ultimately very responsive to that when I when I get an issue um, brought to my attention thank you question number three this is for Julia to begin with it's been said that Lake County is not a county that embraces new business as a supervisor what do you feel would be your role in attracting business to the county as well as providing a more streamlined process for local entrepreneurs to start and grow businesses? Well, I was a new business. Uh, when I first came to Lake County, I opened a business. That was the first thing I did, pretty much. And I found it very welcoming, actually. I, I'm, I actually disagree with that assessment. Um, what I think is difficult is for a large uh, commercial national chain to come to Lake County and expect people to welcome them when it's known that large chains like Dollar General, for example, and Walmarts, they, when they come into a county, they may create, say, 10 jobs, but there's 14 jobs lost. 
and they uh, create un unfair competition and are, are just things that, um, as we, as people who have lived in smaller areas, smaller economies have observed, is something that is better left outside the economy. So I say, you know, I think that question doesn't apply to individuals who are open, looking to start a business, but it does apply to large chains coming to take advantage of our local community members. Thank you. Mo. I don't disagree with that. You know, when I ran for office um, here in Lake County, it, it, I think it was known as, you know, hey, let's keep a small community and other things. I ran for office for economic development. There are a lot of projects right now that are going on in South County, I'm happy to say. There's some real opportunities that'll be game changers. We want to talk about uh, the Gwinnock Langtree project. Uh, you'd like to talk about the Six Sigma project that may be happening in the future. Uh, you have the Brambles project right outside of town. Valley Oaks that has been worked on for years. So when I ran for office, I was really gonna focus on community development. Now we got a lot of work to do there, there's no doubt about it. But opening and inviting folks in to give opportunities here on plots that were zoned for commercial operations, if they meet the requirements, we need to give them the opportunity and the respect that they deserve. The folks that are both selling those properties have an opportunity to change their lives, and the individuals moving in here to create a new business have an opportunity to create jobs and opportunities that are not there for right now. And the other thing that is doing is making sure that we're working with these folks and folding them into the community and making them valuable partners. Thank you. Question number four. What policy changes could be made to streamline the use permit process? That's Mook. Yes, great. <laughs> As you know, uh, we just had a meeting about that, the Board of Supervisors. As the chair, uh, we had a workshop on January 22nd. So we asked some of those que questions directly to our department heads, especially community development. We talk about minor use permits, major use permits, and other things. There are a lot of state laws that have to be followed, CEQA being one of those uh, that is very challenging. So we are looking at currently options to be brought back by the department heads to look how we could streamline those opportunities for ourselves. It is a challenge. If you try to build a large business here, a minor use permit takes about six months usually or at least three, and then a major use permit could take up to two years. You know, it, and it's a real challenge to move through those processes. It costs money as we're working through those things, but we really need solutions from our department heads and the departments that are dealing with this all the time. And we need advocates of the Board of Supervisors, no matter what their feelings are personally about businesses coming in, that we're working to create jobs and opportunities that are gonna help keep our kids here and allow people to have a working wage here in our local area. Thank you. Julia. Um, well, of course, I, I have attempted to do minor use permits myself, and I felt that the process was onerous. Um, I really did. And, and I feel that, that we do need to streamline it to the greatest extent possible. I agree with Moke in that I think we need to consult with the department heads. We need to find out exactly where the roadblocks are, where the time is wasted, and facilitate as much as possible the creation of new locally run businesses in Lake County. Um, I do not think we should be rubber stamping the bringing in of large corporations uh, that, that take all the profits out of the county. I think I believe very strongly in that, such as Dollar General, for example. I don't think we should be rubber stamping their applications. I think we should be looking for other small business owners and facilitating them to the highest degree possible. Thank you. Question number five. Julia goes first on this one. Construction costs are currently much higher than the square foot value of existing homes on the market. What can be done to close this gap so housing construction can increase? Well, I've had the pleasure of living in countries other than the United States. Um, and one of those countries was Mexico. And what I saw when I lived in Mexico was that people would build their own houses. Now that dramatically reduces the cost of construction when you build your own house. They would start with, they would buy 10 cinder blocks and they would put 10 cinder blocks into a wall with some concrete and then they would buy another 10 cinder blocks and they would keep constructing their house poco a poco. And I have to say, I really respected that. I really respected the fact that they could do, they could build an entire house slowly over time within their means and by the end of the day, they had no mortgage. They owned their lot, they owned their house. And I have to say, I really respect that. So I really think we should be looking at teaching people to construct their own homes and allowing our county codes to facilitate that, that type of activity. Safe, safe homes, of course. 
Thank you. Moak. We currently have that opportunity. It's called Owner Builder. Uh, that opportunity is now available to anybody here in the room. You can be an owner builder of your own home. You still will have to go through the permitting and inspection process through the county. There are rules that cannot be waived in most instances, both by the county or by, the, by state law. So the owner builder is an opportunity. What I did as the Board of Supervisors seeing, you know, um, the un unaffordability of rebuilding after the fires, one, not having a workforce and contractors to get the job done. Also the demand was to work on um, smaller square footages for homes. What we've done in my time in which I pushed through community development was to build 360 square foot homes to go to the state level. So we're not gonna call them tiny homes, but we're gonna call them smaller square footage opportunities for folks if they're challenges, if they're either uninsured or, um, or un underinsured or uninsured. And I think those are opportunities that are gonna allow us to rebuild our homes at a more affordable rate for those who can't afford a thousand square foot home, now you can go down to 360. And I think that's long term, that's gonna pay off for investment in our community for both the kids and the family that are going to school here. Moke, you're up next. <laughs> He's getting his cardio today. Um, what will each of you do, if elected, to help rescind the water moratorium imposed on Hidden Valley Lake by the State of California Water Resources Board? Good. Key word, state of, uh, it's, that's at the state level. So what I have done as a Board of Supervisor, he is not there anymore, Kirk Clory, Community Service District, had a meeting with him, said there was an issue that needed to be done. What he was looking for was a letter from myself. I worked with Kirk Cloyd and said, you know, let's take it to the board. Let's get all five supervisors to sign off on this letter and send it to where you want to. You know, I, I've had some folks in the community saying, well, you sent it to the wrong spot. I worked directly with Kirk Cloyd to send that letter and to get it to the individuals that he wanted to. But what I'm gonna do in the future, which I've already done this year as the chair, <coughs> had a conversation with our assemblywoman, Cecilia Aguiar Curry, to tell her it's a very important issue that needs to be done here. Could affect 800 lots for building in the Hidden Valley. Mike McGuire, I'll be with him Friday at a press conference in Mendocino College uh, to talk about the CTE, the workforce program that's being brought into Lake County and uh, Mendocino County. And that'll be another person I'm gonna lean on to help us get this issue figured out. It is a long-standing issue that was there before I came in, but I, my goal is to get it lifted and to use the, the, um, the relationships I've built since I've been in here. Thank you. Julia. Um, I'm aware of this issue, and I'm also aware that it's been going on for years. Um, people without water with lots in Hidden Valley. Um, because you cannot occupy a property without water, you are therefore not able to build on your property. This is unacceptable. Um, these individuals should have been grandfathered under state law. They were not. Uh, this needs to be brought up and pushed, not with just a letter, but with constant calls, regular calls every week to people in charge of, of d determining whether this gets, this gets re um, resolved. Certainly, um, I would also look for creative solutions. Perhaps we can get around the existing regulations with uh, water tanks or with maybe bringing water from adjacent properties or however we can get around it. You cannot keep water away from these lots that people bought with the understanding that they were supposed to be able to build there. Thank Thanks you. Up. Julia, question number seven. We assume you both are familiar with the county's cannabis ordinance. What specific changes would you suggest being made to it if you are elected or reelected? Well, first of all, I have to say, is my turn? Yes. Oh, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm pro-cannabis. Um, I think it's harm reduction for alcohol and tobacco, and I've gone on record as saying so. Um, the cannabis ordinance, as I see it, uh, appears to have some significant flaws regarding the taxation. And this may be something that we need to address either you know, on, an, on a state level as well as just on a county level. Um, but as I understand it, the taxation is on canopy rather than on sales. You know, if I grow tomatoes in my backyard, uh, there is no canopy tax on my tomatoes. They're taxed when I sell them for a profit to someone else. Um, this is inappropriate. We need to bring cannabis into line with how we treat things like vineyards and tomato crops and whatever other crops that we're growing in Lake County, um, to have it with a, a set of, of rules that are completely different to um, other agricultural products is inappropriate. We need to bring it into regulated, legalized use. Thank you. For the benefit no. of the county. Excellent. Well, 
obviously, when I ran for the board, I, you know, it was passed by the voters of the state of California to legalize marijuana for um, recreational use. Uh, the ordinance needed to be completed. I'm proud to say that coming on the board in the first nine months, we had got an ordinance put together. The one thing that separates cannabis is it's a Schedule One narcotic. A Schedule One narcotic cannot be regulated like tomato or grapes or anything else. It's a Schedule One narcotic. Until the federal government makes some changes at their level, at the state level, or at the county and at the state level, we just have to work through the processes we're trying to establish this industry. I think we've done a good job. There are a lot of things that can be fixed um, in the ordinance, uh, where it's located, how it's located, uh, road access, 4290, 4291 is a big issue we deal with on, on emergency vehicle access and other things. But what we've done is we've put in a one-year review each year. And so what we're going to do is work with the cannabis industry to hopefully establish this industry each year, make changes, and that'll be coming up here soon where we can really work on this product being a real business and opportunity here for the county. But it is a Schedule One narcotic. Don't sit down, Luke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, question number eight. The Board of Supervisors oversees many departments, often dealing with employee matters, and they approve a final budget of several millions of dollars. Please describe what experience you have managing people and budgets. Well, I've been doing that as a tribal leader for over 21 years. Uh, we manage all of our grants and opportunities on the government side. But we also operate a multi-million dollar business, the Twin Pine Casino and Hotel. That is a government gaming operation. We set the budgets on both sides for both the tribal nation, our gaming regulators, and also the casino. From the county side, now I've been through three budget cycles. Uh, working through the process of restricted funds, which are most of them. The budget this year, I think, was $258 million with a $60 million uh, general fund, which is funded mostly by property taxes. And the rest of the stuff is restricted funds. Some of our larger department is Dep uh, Department of Social Services. And so some are self-funded. And those are opportunities we need to do each year and looking at how we're gonna improve the budgets. Also coming on board, looking at the budgets and opportunities are there. The county owned properties that were sale. I'm proud to say we've uh, sold the castle, uh, which was a two and a half million dollar um, investment to the county, back to their funds, uh, Holiday Harbor, and we use those to stabilize the budgets and the reserves as we move forward uh, this year, so. Thank you. Julia. Um, well, clearly, as someone who believes in the importance of financial prudence, we need to be balancing our budget. That is something that has not been done over the last few years in the county, perhaps understandably as a result of the fire and the re resulting reduction in revenues. Um, I have worked as uh, vice president of Bank of America for six years. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, vice president at other major international banks like Manufacturers Harbor Trust and Solomon Brothers International Limited. Um, I have extensive experience working both with employees and also with budgeting matters. I sit on the board of seven nonprofits. Um, we we you know, go over budgetary matters regularly, um, very financially astute. So this is something where, um, first of all, I would be really looking at balancing our budget. Um, you know, maybe some, uh, revenue generating opportunities, grant writing, um, things like that, bringing a grant writer perhaps into Lake County to work for local organizations to help raise funds, um, as well as for the county. Um, there's money that we could probably tap into that isn't being currently utilized, and I think that's one area where I'd really like to be able to contribute my financial expertise. Thank you. Julia, question number nine. What skill, area of knowledge, excuse me, or expertise do you possess that you believe unique, uniquely qualifies you to represent District 1 on the Board of Supervisors? Well, I went over that in my introduction. Um, I think that my uh, intelligence, my ability to solve problems, complex problems, uh, my um, ability to think strategically and forward-thinking uh, abilities, and also my ethical stance. Uh, my ethical stance is very strong. I actually am a minister. Um, I perform weddings for individuals, um, both in the county and elsewhere. And uh, I feel very strongly that um, I am less susceptible to corruption than other people. Thank you. Monk. Excellent. I think I talked about it also. Uh, my tribal leadership is really what I think prepared me for this. Over 21 years working with state and federal agencies, and to operate on grant opportunities, but also driving a thriving business that is operating here. 
that employs over 330 people. I think that gives me a real opportunity to look at budget setting, how to work and build a workforce that is positive, uh, that enjoys coming to work, and is good at what they do. Uh, their record shows why we're successful. So over the past 21 years, I think I've prepared myself in many different ways, but moving into this and really representing this community is being here and understanding the people that are really looking to help it move forward. And I'm proud to have the opportunity to do that. I've uh, married three people as a board of supervisor. I can do that also. You know, I'm proud to say, and I track down my families uh, that I have married, and I will watch them until uh, I'm gone. Uh, but there's opportunities here, I think, for myself and others to grow at all times. I'm always learning. If you disagree with me, I'll sit down and talk with you. If I've done something wrong, I'll admit it. But what I'm trying to do always is grow as a person and just get better at what I'm doing here for the District 1. Thank you. I want to remind those in the audience that if, you, if a question comes to mind, um, feel free to go back and fill out uh, one of the tablets there and bring the question forward. If you haven't heard it yet or something that's been said so far has reminded you of a question that you would like to pose. And now we go to Moak first. What should be the number one priority of the Board of Supervisors and why? Right now, the number one priority of the Board of Supervisors is a class and comp study. Since I came on board, what we need to do is work hard to improve the living wages that we have for our over 900 employees. What we're always dealing with, and you as a public are dealing with, is an overturn of employees, new faces that you see all the time. So we need to be working on the class and comp study that's being worked right now. Hopefully this year, like I've said, there's gonna be some decisions that need to may, be made to reset ourselves, and I am a long-term vision guy for this decade and to help us move forward. But that is the number one issue at this point that I see the Board of Supervisors needs to concentrate on. And what we need to do is invest in those employees that are gonna take care of our constituents, which you are our customers, and to help us move forward. Couldn't be any prouder to be setting where I am. Those aren't easy decisions, you know, and we're gonna to have to make them. I'm proud to be setting with the folks that I am on the board, Tina Scott, who came on with me, and we, you know, got to go through some real training that happened when we came on the board that really opened our eyes and how we're gonna move this county forward. So right now, the class and comp is the number one issue for me and the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Julia. I really disagree with that. I think that the number one issue is not how, you know, employees of the county, I think the number one issue is for the residents of the county and the fact that they were facing regular wildfires. The fact that climate change is not being addressed. The fact that uh, we don't have a work, you know, a, a volunteer force of significant magnitude to be able to handle something like the Valley Fire when it comes up again. And it's not about if it comes up again, it's about when. And that's why we need some real community preparedness that it goes well beyond what we presently have. Um, the existing preparation completely failed us. Our town lost 80% of its residences. There is no reason that we're not addressing that as our number one issue. Absolutely, definitely going forward. Thank you. I'm going to interject a question that was submitted by someone in the audience for both of you. Uh, PRC code 923 requires utility companies to clear vegetation to six foot away from power lines under 110,000 volts and 10 feet if over 110,000 volts. Do you think this is adequate? If not, would you encourage state officials to increase this distance? And this will be Julia first. I think we've been addressing these issues all wrong. Uh, I really don't want to be seeing our trees cut down for power wires or trimmed in, in, a, in very aggressive ways. Um, what I would like to see is these power lines going underground. I know it's expensive, but we're in a high wildfire zone. Paradise right now is getting all of their wires underground. France has all of their wires underground anyway, everywhere. Why are we still having above ground wires being put up in Lake County where we obviously have a problem? This would also help resolve our PSP, uh, was it PSPS issues um, as far as the power shutoffs. Um, this is something we really need to look at as a county. Thank you. Moak. That's a long-term solution. 
that, that's a very long-term solution as far as undergrounding um, those things. But all those issues are being talked about. As far as the vegetation uh, abatement that PG&E needs to be done, the Board of Supervisors, including with our CAL FIRE representatives here at South Lake Fire, we do a proclamation every year to remind them of their duties uh, to clearing and the vegetation under the lines. Three feet, six feet, ten feet, those are all things of the past. At this point, we do have lines above ground. We do have lines that go through forests. There is going to be tree trimming that's going to be part of that. Three dollars a square, three dollars a foot to underground those things. It's just not financially feasible. These are independent operating utilities. We need to work with them with immediate <laughs> solutions here that affect us during the PSPSs. Uh, from the county standpoint, we put together an ad hoc committee, and we're also looking at have meetings with PG&E to make sure that it's addressed here locally uh, better next year than it was. But as far as tree trimming and other things, we need to be looking at all options. And undergrounding, obviously, is a long-term solution to that issue right now. Thank you. Um, Mo. this next one is uh, also for you, and it does address the PSPS. Um, in, your, in your experience dealing with the shutdowns, what do you see that the county could do further than it has done uh, notwithstanding the upcoming meetings with the uh, CPUC and uh, PG&E. PG &E. What can the county do? So the county in preparation for preparing for this, obviously there are all kinds of opportunities. I think we move into solar, battery backup, alternative energy solutions for a long-term solution here, uh, whether we're reaching out to other counties that have their own independent energy agencies, some of our neighbors, Sonoma Green, other things like that. We need to really start looking at those solutions internally. But what we did as a county was to make sure that we spent some money on generators, backup opportunities so we keep the offices open. The long-term solutions are going to be working with PG&E to make sure there's CRCs when this is happening here locally for ourselves. The other issues are going to be um, microgrid situations and other things like that that we need to do. What I've done personally is attended CPUC hearings, the Senate hearings that happen on PG&E to let them know it's unacceptable, but to work on solutions. We are not going to solve the independent operating uh, utility agencies problems, but we're going to make sure that we work hard here locally to take care of our local issues, constituents, and businesses. And that's what we're doing and moving forward with the meetings we have coming up and being prepared for 2020's season that'll be here before we know it. Thank you. Julia. Well, I, you know, I do think the county has been doing some things, and, and that's useful. Um, as far as what they could do more, um, I see we could have a generator rental pool, for example. Um, this would allow people that actually need a generator to operate something like the refrigerator or something to rent it temporarily. And generators are fairly expensive. You know, local people may not have the expendable money to put that out. Also, I'd like to really address the fact that generators put out a, a heck of a lot of, uh, you know, emissions um, compared to uh, regular le le electricity generation. We should be looking at microgrids, like Muck mentioned. We should be looking at other um, things like solar, uh, you know, wind generation. Uh, if we can do ad ad additional geothermal or hydroelectric power, ways to bring electricity in county that is that we can put underground wires to our to our towns in order to be able to supply uh, power to our businesses and to our residents without having to worry about PG&E and P PSPS shutoffs. Thank you. Uh, Julia, you're up next. What is your vision for sustainable economic development for Lake County using specific examples and reference documents? Well, Reference documents, I would like to, you know, defer to uh, actual, you know, research. I, I'm a scientist, so that's my educational background, so I don't just, you know, mention reference documents without actually having a link or something or, you know, a, a proper reference. So uh, come back to me on that or, or, you know, email me privately through my website. Um, as far as sustainable economic uh, things that we could be doing, certainly agriculture is something this county is really, really um, well suited for. Um, it doesn't create a huge blight on the landscape. It, you know, I, I don't think we really want to be looking at uh, large industrial complexes spewing out a bunch of uh, you know, pollutants into our otherwise fine, clear air. So um, I wouldn't be looking to bring large industry into the county. What I would be looking to bring is um, things like uh, cannabis cultivation in, in uh, substantial quality, not, not quantity, not so much um, 
from large corporations like Monsanto, for example, is going to put a bunch of pesticides into our environment, but instead by, by uh, large collectives that are growing for the benefit of uh, a wider group locally. Um, I'd also like to see uh, the county become a, uh, a mecca for those who, from Silicon Valley and from other parts of the, of the country where they can perform technological activities uh, remotely in Lake County. So I think we need to have a very high level uh, technological infrastructure to support that. Okay, we'll give Mo um, one and a half minutes since Julia went over. Um, do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah, repeat that question. Okay. What is your vision for sustainable economic development for Lake County using specific examples and reference documents? Reference documents. Uh, that, one, that one may be tricky. But uh, long sustainable economic development opportunities. Well, like I talked about the projects that are currently being um, constructed or in the use permit process right now here locally. Um, it's supporting those individuals who want to bring in business. Uh, when it gets to the Board of Supervisors, that's the most important thing. I say this all the time with the Board of Supervisors, it stops at us. We need to make votes that give opportunities for businesses to move forward. When it gets to us, we not only need to talk about it, we need to make the votes that are moving forward. The first wall up, and then the business will come. The long-term sustaining economic development project we really need to move forward with is rebranding who we are, help support the businesses that move through the building process, and really look at the opportunities that are out there. I think the cannabis industry is one of those tools, but it's gonna be a long-term solution until the Schedule One narcotic is done. As far as agriculture, I think we've done a great job of really building up that business, the wineries and other things, but we need places for people to stay. We really need them to come up here for the weekends, enjoy what they have, and then take their tax dollars home. But we've built an industry here in agriculture that needs to be really honed in on the hotel rooms and other opportunities and resorts around the entire community and the lake as they stay here. So, Thank you. Um, I'm going to interject a question that has come from someone watching um, the um, forum this evening. What's hap And this would go to Moat first. What's happening with properties that need clearing and the owners are absent? Oh. That is a challenge. Um, but what we've done as a county is we have put in, for the first time in history, a vegetation abatement ordinance. It was uh, put together and operated over April through this uh, fire season. We are going to be reviewing that um, ordinance here coming up in the next couple of months. And we'll be looking at opportunities how we can improve on that with the large landowners and other vacant lot owners so we can go after them. Now what we've done with this vegetation abatement ordinance is put in an abatement process so there's some teeth in it. This year will be the second round. We had thousands of letters that went out last year. We had a lot of compliance, but we've really got to hone in on the large landowners and the ones that weren't compliant. What we're also doing from the county level through the JPA and the Risk Reduction Authority is also looking at building our firewise communities and other opportunities where if neighbors, they can't afford to clean properties or there are other opportunities, neighbors help with neighbors, different opportunities like that to get things cleared out. There are always ways to get things done, and we just need to keep improving on those. The second year of the vegetation abatement ordinance, hoping is going to take those steps to help us really work with the absent landowners that are here in Lake County, which there are a lot of them. Thank you. Julia. Um, yes, uh, I understand that the vegetation uh, abatement ordinance was passed. I had actually some considerable, I like, tried to look into the matter. I, tried, I had considerable difficulty actually finding the text of the actual ordinance online, which I think needs to be clarified, because if someone is supposed to do something, it should be really clearly stated as to what they are supposed to do. And that is one of the problems I think facing landowners right now is they don't actually know what they're supposed to do. Nobody's been, as far as I know, nobody's been sent a, a letter in, you know, informing them of this. Perhaps you have to be in, in uh, you know, in, you know, against, you have to be doing something that is problematic in order to be sent this letter, but I think everybody should know what is involved. Um, as far as the properties that need, need cleaning with absentee owners, um, it depends why they're not clearing right now. Are they not clearing because of lack of funds? Are they not clearing because of lack of uh, notification? Are they, you know, not, not clearing for what reason? Um, if they are, you know, economically disadvantaged, then could we consider some uh, volunteer work to assist them? Um, I think right now the county's basically trying to abate, you know, or threatening to abate at ex significant expense to individuals, which could result in, in liens or loss of property. And I'm not really in favor of that. 
Thank you. The homeless crisis is well documented across the country, as well as in our county. What would your plan be to address this issue as a county supervisor? And Julia goes first. Well, first of all, I think we need to have homes. And, and this has been the big problem in Lake County and why we start to see homeless for the first time in the, in the you know, 20 years that I've lived here. Um, we need to have homes. So homes, uh, you know, there's been some good, good work done, and I have to credit Moog for this in getting the 360 square foot home, homes uh, approved. Um, that's a big deal, and uh, I would like to see even smaller than that. I would also like to see uh, temporary homes, uh, such as uh, teepees, such as uh, yurts. Um, I lived for a while in, uh, in Hilo in Hawaii, and there was a, um, right near a, a, an active volcano. And because there was an active volcano there, which is kind of a similar situation to our wildfire uh, you know, uh, proximity, um, they weren't building permanent structures. So they put up yurts and they were very livable, very pleasant. So this gets people out of our parks, this gets people out of cars, this gets people having a home base that they can then um, you know, function from. And I think that's what we need to be looking at. These things only cost a couple thousand dollars, they're relatively cheap to put up, um, and they can be self-constructed. So um, I am very much in favor of anything that gets someone a shelter that they can feel comfortable in. Thank you. Moke. I think what the issue is, as, as we deal with the homeless issue, is the real issue is mental health. Mental health is what we need to really look at, I think, um, as we start to deal with the, in, the homeless issue here locally and throughout the United States. Mental health issues are a lot of problems, whether they're self-medicating or other things are usually reasons why folks end up in the situation that they're in. They're unable to maintain a job, and then they lose their home, and those opportunities are going. Behavioral health, there's a lot of money coming down from the state of California. Behavioral health will be focusing on housing, mental health issues, and other things as we address this. The point in time count just happened, so we know our homeless um, uh, uh, population here. Uh, that'll start to come out. And then looking at reaching out to the community, our churches, other nonprofit organizations that can help us work through um, for transitional housing. Uh, we have the um, whole care programs that are being worked on throughout the county. And I think these are all ways that we're going to be able to address it. But it does come down to homes. And ultimately, that's going to have to be something that's funded either through state um, budgets or uh, grants and move on from there. Thank you. Uh, questions submitted by the audience. Who keeps, and this would be Moat first, who keeps the refuse collection service in compliance? I have gone three weeks without my trash not, not being picked up after numerous complaints and calls. So, public services is the one that brings the contract. Whoever asked that question is, um, is brought to the Board of Supervisors. So we have independent contractors here that contract with the county. Uh, Large Ewing Public Services brings that, negotiates that. There's also, um, you know, a couple of committees that are set on that we work with that, but that independent contracting is done and brought to the Board of Supervisors through public services. So what I would recommend for that individual is to reach out to their individual provider, and depending what district they're in, I reach out to your supervisor and see if you can get some information and help on what needs to be done with that supplier. If you're paying your bills, they should pick them up, and if you're not getting a response, I would say reach out to your supervisor and see if you can solve that problem. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to interject that the uh, phone number for public services is 262-1618. Julia. Um, yes, as, as Moke says, you know, he needs to contact the uh, individuals who are responsible for not picking that up. It, just because refuse wasn't collected doesn't explain why it wasn't collected. Um, so I'd like to get more information on the case. Uh, as far as, though, I wanted to mention something under this umbrella that I consider to be very important, that is recycling. Um, we actually do our own recycling. Um, so we take it to, Lake, to uh, Clear Lake and, and take it to the single, single stream recycling usually. And lately, um, every time I go up there, there is something new that I can't put in my, uh, in my recycling. There, first of all, it was styrofoam, then it was plastic bags, then it was cardboard, then it was this and that. So you know, it, it just creates this incredible burden on those who wish to create you know, and live sustainably um, and live in a green way. Um, and 
when I did when I was there last time, the individual at the thing made me pick through every single little piece, and you know, like you know, <laughs> it was really quite onerous. And he said, "Well, if you don't like it, ask your supervisor." So Mo, <laughs> I'm asking you, why aren't we able to recycle? Thank you. Can I respond to that? Yes, please. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so it's, it's a global issue, as you know. Uh, they they trying to quit buying the recycling. They got stricter. Yeah. There's opportunities. There, there's there's no money in it. And it is going to be challenging. You know, there are state laws that we're supposed to recycle as much as possible. But if no one's purchasing it, there's not a market for it. You can't move it. And it's becoming more challenging. It's a global issue that we're all dealing with. We know how the seas are at this point with plastic and other things inundating that. And it's an industry maybe that we have to look at different opportunities. You know, when you look at uh, there's, there's biochar, there's refining, there's other things. When you think outside of the box, there may be opportunities that you can look at uh, down the road. But that's, that's the reality of it. You know, just because you think you flush your toilet and it goes somewhere, it's got to be processed, it's got to go somewhere. You know, those things, just like recycling. If they're not taking it, there's nowhere to put it, there's no money for it, things start to fold up. You saw the one in town that went away as far as a recycling center, that was a business decision. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Uh, in this day and age, but we need to think about innovative opportunities that may affect the things that we're doing for jobs and opportunities here locally. Thank you. Okay, we've had some more uh, questions submitted by the audience, and um, I have one for Julia and then one for Moak. Uh, Julia, what would you do differently than Moak would? And it doesn't give me a topic, it just is a general comment. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, I would start by saying that, you know, I think my, my strength really is the fact that I'm an activist. I don't just wait for the world to change. I help make a change. And so that's when I, when I say that I'm here to make a change, that's what I'm here to do. Uh, so where I see the changes need to be made, where I see that really something is, I'm gonna be behind it. I'm gonna be pushing it. I'm gonna be moving it rather than waiting, kind of maybe hinting that it should happen, putting it in motion. So again, you've got an activist on your side who's made a real difference. Thank you. All right, Moak, your question. If tourism and places to stay are so important, why has the county gone after Airbnbs with taxes and other onerous measures? That's the law. There is an ordinance. If you're gonna operate a business, it's called TOT. TOT helps pay for many different things here in the county. It helps for law enforcement. It also helps for our marketing and advertising. But there is an ordinance. If you're gonna operate a less than 30 days, you're going to have short-term rentals and other things, there is a permit that you need to have to operate a business. That's the way it works. We started looking at every opportunity to improve the overall welfare of the county. Part of that business was looking at the Airbnb opportunities and what people are doing here and not paying their taxes. And so we went through the process. We sent out letters to individuals who started doing that after the fires. We started to know it grow. Airbnb has a lot of rentals here in South County. When we talk about housing issues, folks are building homes and renting them out, not letting people buy them. So as far as that, and there's also an industry of folks that are doing the right thing. They are paying their TOT taxes and there's an ordinance in place, and so we went after them to really help the county and to make sure that they're in compliance with the ordinance that's set in place. Thank you. Another audience submittal. Hidden Valley is the second largest population center in Lake County. Law enforcement, code enforcement, and animal control are often left to the Homeowners Association to resolve. What are some ideas on how we can better cooperate in resolving those types of issues? And this would be Moak first. So I know, uh, if you don't know, uh, Hidden Valley is an HOA. It's a homeowners association. Uh, what we do, obviously, is since I came on board, is trying to reach out to Hidden Valley. I've taken plenty of numerous calls on many different issues, chickens, bees, 
uh, not only dogs and other issues, but there are plenty of issues to do. So as far as my role as District 1 Supervisor, it's working with the Hidden Valley leadership and other folks out there as we can work through our issues to work together to address the community issues that are happening. Um, like I said, very interesting ones that happen, but also the relationship needs to be uh, clarified. As the Board of Supervisors, you know, it is District 1. They are one of the wealthiest communities in, in, in Lake County also, which I'm very proud of having here in our district. But it is very important that we respect their HOA status, their board, and the individuals living out there. Sheriff's Department and other things coordinate with their security. Um, we've worked through with Community Service District on other issues. Um, but it's a really a collaboration and working together on how we help the folks that are living out there uh, with intermingling both county and the HOA. Thank you. Julia. Well, I lived in Hidden Valley for three years and I keep in touch with the community via Facebook groups. Um, I've found that uh, the real issue with, with Hidden Valley and the reason that I moved was because of the lock gate. And I know that people live there for that reason, but part of the reason is if you're gonna lock your gate, you can't expect you know, uh, county activities you know, like law enforcement to just easily come in and patrol and, and law, you know, animal control officers and so on again. So you have to deal with the locked gate issue. Um, the Homeowners Association also sets certain rules, uh, which are voluminous, about that thick, or last I remember, maybe they're thicker now. And it's really quite challenging to negotiate all of those um, in relation to county ordinances. So, you know, it requires people to sit down from both communities, or, you know, from the, from the county and from the Homeowners Association and see where, where uh, economies of scale can be, can be created, where there's, uh, you know, no overlap in services being provided and, and so on regarding law enforcement and uh, uh, animal control, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Um, this was sent in via email and it was predicated upon the comments at the uh, candidate forum on Monday evening, but I think it will pertain to all three of our forum, forums. And the statement was, it is too easy to say, I will put a chicken in every pot, paraphrasing, but how do they, meaning county government, plan to do it? I heard some pretty big plans last evening, meaning Monday night, but those plans would cost the citizens a lot of money, and it's important that we all know what we are voting for. So I believe the question for this forum is, and this would be Julia going first, how do you see the county funding many of the proposals and discussion that we've had this evening to resolve problems, existing issues. How do you see that money being raised? What would you see the resources for those funds to be? Um, well, traditionally funds have been raised through uh, property taxation. Um, that is where, you know, people, um, pay for the benefits of their, of their county, uh, for the most part. There are also some incidental fees like fire, fire prevention fees, fire maintenance, uh, you know, fighting fees and so on. So there's, there's taxation and, and that's how it has been mostly done. And, and the revenue from that then gets, gets split out among various sources. There's also potentially grants that can be uh, written and funded for. I did mention that I think we should have a grant writer if there's not already one on staff, um, that that is a very important element of fundraising. Um, there can also be, community donations for specific causes, of uh, fundraisers. Um, and I think that's some, somewhere that, you know, say the nonprofit organizations that I worked for were really good at doing, is creating um, community interest in benefiting a certain project and boosting that. As far as um, a chicken in every pot, what I would say is that um, food security is very important. Uh, one of the ways we can assure food security is actually by, you know, looking more to plant foods than, than um, animal foods. Um, this is something that I found is exceedingly healthy for individuals as well as being much more affordable and sustainable uh, ecologically. So that's another thing we can consider is, um, you know, educating people as to the benefits of um, not having chickens in pots and instead having them in our backyard as friends. Um, thank you. Um, Mo Q you had, you've got another 30 seconds if you'd like on that one. 
Well, when I ran for office, economic development. Economic development is how we're going to move this county forward. That's how we're going to pay for it. Whether folks are for development or not, you look at it simply. The property tax that new businesses and opportunities are going to drive to the county are how we're going to put a chicken in every pot. And we're not going to be able to put a chicken in every pot, but we're going to have a long-term economic development strategy and plan. We need to bring new businesses and opportunities and have them built here. We need to make those decisions at the Board of Supervisors, and everything will trickle down to the community. Jobs, opportunity, and education. There are a lot of things. You can be as picky as you want when you're living in a well-off community. This county needs to take that step in this decade to really move ourselves forward. You're being forced out in the Bay Area. They're coming this way. We need to set up the infrastructure, have the jobs, and the economic development to keep people here. As we educate our kids, they need to have places to work so they can stay here. We need to improve on the infrastructure that needs to be built out. And that's what I plan on doing for the next decade. I ran for this office to do that. You will start to see projects and foundations come up in District 1. I'm proud of that, but we're going to do that all over the county. I just only work for District 1. I represent everyone in Lake County, all 67,000 people, and every project that is viable around the lake needs to be looked at. And we as a Board of Supervisors need to get out of that mindset of not building and having opportunities. And we're going to do that this year, I hope. I know that we have some folks that are really looking forward to that, and those decisions will be coming down. 2020 is going to start the decade of Lake County being what we are. Beautiful, beautiful place, beautiful people, but a thriving economy as we move forward in this next decade. And that's what I plan on doing as we move forward here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm only reading this, okay? <laughs> I didn't write it. That's my disclaimer. So, and unfortunately I didn't see who brought it up here, so I can't chase them down if we have a bunch of booing. Um, do you think there is corruption in the county government? If so, how would you take care of stopping that? And that would be Milk. From the outside in, you know, that's an easy thing to say. What I will say, corruption in the county government, absolutely not. There's no corruption in county government. Now, do the, our department heads and other things need support? Absolutely. If you know anything about it, in which I learned very much, the Brown Act, uh, you're only allowed to talk to one other board member and other things. There are ethical trainings that you need to go through as the board. And since I've been on uh, the Board of Supervisors, the honesty and the integrity that we have at the, at the county government is above all um, honest. It, it is. You know, I, I'm not sure uh, what that question means as far as if you look outside, you want to talk about corruption? I drive a Dodge 2015. I ain't living in no mansion. I live like everyone else, a paycheck to paycheck. And you know what I believe? The people that work hard for us every day, they're the ones that need to get paid. And our department heads, we need to work on that. I talked about class and comp. But if you're going to talk corruption, um, I, I need to see some instances of that. Now, you may have folks that could be better at their job. There's no doubt about that. And we're going to work on those things. But corruption, absolutely not. Thank you. Julia. I beg to differ. <laughs> I have sat in, board of super, in planning department meetings where large corporations like Verizon were basically rubber stamped by our planning commission, despite widespread community uh, uh, disagreement as evidenced by uh, petitions, uh, public online petitions. Um, I cannot believe that, given all the opposition, that this sort of uh, thing would be rubber stamped. Um, fortunately, the Planning Commission denied it. So I was impressed with the fact that our elected officials, or the, the people at least, at least were on the, the Planning Commission, were, were um, in accordance with the community. But the fact that there was an individual working in the department that uh, clearly did not take the wishes that had been expressed to them over and over again um, by the community and by representatives of the community, including myself, um, that we did not want to see a particular item appearing in our community, um, they went ahead and rubber stamped it. So, it, you know, to me, there, and I've also spoken to other individuals who served in the county who have told me that one of the biggest issues that Lake County faces is corruption. So, 
Okay. I would have to say that, that maybe there is a problem, and that that's something, be, by having an ex extremely strong ethical background, that's something that I intend to weed out, to keep my eyes open for, and to, whenever observable, cut its head off. Uh, Moke, you get another 30 seconds. Well, when you talk, want to talk about ethics, ethics are not listening to rumors, um, you know, and spreading those rumors uh, negatively about folks. As a board of supervisor, the FCC controls uh, the Verizon Towers, all the media, uh, the Verizon Towers and other things that come in, towers that come in here, radio antennas. They have done a good job at the federal level setting themselves up to pretty much move in wherever they want. If you've noticed, the Planning Commission and both the Board of Supervisors are trying to strengthen those rules to help with our land use issues, but it is a challenge. It's a lot from the federal government uh, down to the counties, and it's challenging. But when you talk about ethics and corruption, you need to make sure you know what you're talking about and not spread rumors or lies. You know, somebody told me is not a proof of corruption. That's a violation of, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to re respond or even repeat something that somebody thought they heard or thought they said. No, they said it, and it was Thank testimony you. to me. Thank you. Um, okay, Moke, you get this one. Um, why was Dollar General approved for Middletown after almost 800 members of the community signed a petition against it? I talked about it when I started. If a business moves into an area that is zoned commercial, uh, they need to be treated like any other business. You know, when I started, you know, um, as a Board of Supervisors, that was one of the first decisions I made. And when I ran for office, I made it very clear. I am here for economic development. If it meets the requirements, it meets the zoning ordinance, gives you an opportunity to bring jobs here to the county, then that's what we're going to do. And I will move forward with it doing that way. The Middletown area plan says they need to conform to our community. I think the one misstep there was I was a supervisor then to make sure as they're coming in and they're building an opportunity for us that they do build something that will fit into the community. As we move forward, as long as they're treated fairly and equally, everyone, that's one of the things that I'll do. And Dollar General, and one other thing I want to make a point of, yeah, 800 signatures, maybe 1,000. Just to let you know, there's 9,700 people in District 1. 9,700. There are a lot of folks that were very upset that we did not have Dollar General. They cannot afford to drive to Walmart round trip. They cannot afford to go to Hardister's all month long. And I love Hardister's. It's a great business, but some people can't afford to shop there in our one local store here. We need to give them opportunities as we move forward. That's why I'm excited about some businesses maybe happening out at the Valley Oaks project. We need opportunities uh, to bring to the community that are at financial, different, different financial levels because I'm not representing the folks that have a second home or different opportunities or a business. I'm representing the mother, the single mom who has three kids at the end of the month, can't afford to put food on the table or pay rent. Those are the folks that I'm thinking about in those projects. All right, Julia, you have a minute and a half. Um, I oppose the Dollar General uh, stores. Again, it, it is completely contrary to the Middletown it's area plan, plan, which I have uh, vowed to uphold as part of my um, Thing. This was that was developed in consultation with the community. So to have a supervisor come in and vote against the community, the community that has also signed a petition in large numbers. In fact, almost everyone in Middletown. Remember, the people signing that petition were Middletowners. We weren't Lower Lakers. We weren't even probably Hidden Valleyers. We were mostly Middletowners. People who worked or lived in Middletown and did not want to see Dollar General come in. Um, this is important. This is really important to our community. Um, I cannot say this over and over and over again without maybe making an impression upon you, Moke, that we do not want to see large corporations come into town um, that take our profits out of town. I lived in a small town in Mexico, and I saw this company called OXO come in and take over every single corner virtually that had any commercial potential in that small town. It pushed all the mom and pa businesses out of business. People that I knew for years as, as uh, you know, proprietors of their own business who employed their children and so on, they were all pushed out of business by this company that sold a bunch of crappy food and soft drinks. I mean, it was, it was terrible. So I don't want to see that happen in our small town. I've seen it already happen once in a small town in Mexico, and I don't want to see it happen again. It's really important. Thank you. Job well, is not just a job. It's a whether it dignifies the individual. Julia? <laughs> Okay, 
Um, I've got two more questions here, <clears throat> one of which I am um, having some difficulty deciphering because it's beautiful script, but I'm going to save that while I ask this one. Uh, and let's see, this would be Julia, Julia first. Um, what are some of the steps the county government can take to promote a more fire safe region aside from abatement in fire safe communities? Okay. Fire safe. Um, now, this is this is a really interesting question because I've looked into this in great detail after the Valley Fire. Uh, I honestly never thought the Valley Fire would happen. It did. Um, it created as much of a shock for me. It came to the back gate of our church. It was that close. I lost a lot of neighbors. I lost a lot of friends. Our church lost a lot of members. So, you know, I don't mean that their lives were lost, but the fact their their our friendships with them were lost because they needed to move away. So. Preventing fire is incredibly important to me. One of the things that I think we need to do is um, create a fire militia. This is something that other countries like Switzerland do, where able-bodied individuals volunteer. Now, they actually draft people, believe it or not. But in, in our community, I would suggest volunteering. And they um, get training, and they get equipment, and they get um, the ability to, instead of being herded out of their town like cattle, when the fire is coming at them, they can fight. And really, that's what we need. Last time in the Valley Fire, I saw a, you know, something saying 17 people were on the fire, and I saw these huge flames and everything. There was no way 17 people were going to stop that fire. There's no way the current 35 people are going to stop that fire. What's going to stop that fire is 1,000 people, 1,000 people or, or more, you know, actively knowing how to fight fires and being active on the site fighting fires. Thank you, Julia. Moak, minute and a half. So what the county needs to do, obviously, is become a fire safe county. Uh, we're working on that with the risk reduction authority that's been put together, the JPA, with all the fire departments here, all five throughout the county. And we need to look at supporting our firewise communities, which Hidden Valley, uh, Cobb Mountain, and the other ones around the lake, so we can really coordinate on what's being done. There are a lot of things being done right now. We are way better off than we were on the 2015 Valley Fire. And we're going to continue building on that through the Risk Reduction Authority and the other meetings that we're having throughout the county to support our firewise communities. We're going to do outreach. We're going to do meetings. We're going to look at different opportunities to do um, burning uh, symposiums here on local and private properties. We're going to look at tree trimming, vegetation abatement, all of those. We're going to work with our local utilities to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do, but really relying on the education and the opportunities here with our local firefighters, both CAL FIRE, forestry, conservation crews, and other things to really work through um, making this community firewise, not just one, the entire county. That's what we're focusing on. Proud to say, being appointed to the State Board of Fire Services, we're sitting around the table with the individuals that are hopefully going to help us move forward and achieve those goals uh, here in Lake County. But we are much better than we were. And I will tell you, I appreciate every one of the firemen that are out there on the fire lines. We've done a much better job from the state level getting pre-positioned uh, uh, folks and ready to go. Now when there is a high re a red warning or flag warning that happens, there are pre-positioned crews that stay here in the county, work very close with Lake County Fire Protection District, make sure we have the trucks and room for them to be here. But as all you have seen, especially in the Kincaid fire, it is a whole new day in fighting fires. The resources that are dropped on those now are just absolutely critical. And I'll tell you what, going and making relationships and making sure that Lake County's had enough as we move through it, it was shown this year with the Kincaid fire as it happened. So we're going to continue on that level of building a firewise Lake County through the Risk Reduction Authority and the other firewise communities. Thank you. Um, okay. Good thing I worked with a lot of engineers at Raytheon because I'm able to decide for this finally. And Moak, you're first. Along with the growth and development of other California counties has often come a escalation of cost of living to where many areas around us are now unaffordable for the middle class. What steps should Lake County take to avoid a similar escalation? It's going to be a. 
Who's that? <laughs> Not guilty. Somebody recording. Excellent. You know, obviously, um, that, that's going to be a challenge as, as we move forward. But that's a ways off at this point right now for Lake County. I think what we need to look at is developing opportunities for economic development, housing issues, and other things as we're growing, as we're becoming the county that we need to be. Um, the thing that really is in our favor at this point is we do have affordable housing, we do have affordable property, and other things to be built on. But having the infrastructure, the jobs, that will allow to have a good paying wage here in Lake County is something we need to focus on. I think we're doing that. Um, but it is a challenge because the raising of the minimum wage is a great thing. It's a great idea, but it also hurts small businesses. Being a restaurant owner here locally in town, as that minimum wage moves up, it makes it a real challenge to keep uh, employees employed. You kind of shrink your workforce and go from there. But really where we're going to do it is creating jobs and opportunities that are higher paying here locally, and that's going to come with economic development. Some of the projects being contemplated now in our district are going to do that, and that's going to be some real opportunities for folks uh, to survive here. Thank you. Julia. Well, the escalation of the cost of living is a um, basically a gentrification issue. Um, as you get you know, more attention uh, put onto Lake County as a, as a destination, as a living position. As you see people coming from Silicon Valley who are remote workers, you're going to see more money coming into the community. Businesses are going to see they can charge more. You know, uh, renters, are, uh, sorry, landlords are going to see that they can charge more and everything will go up in price. Um, it's happened, it happens everywhere that gentrification occurs. So um, is that something we don't want as a county? Is it, or is that something we do want as a county? And, and I think we need to ask ourselves, how do we feel about that? In terms of um, the people that already live here coping with a rise in, in uh, living costs, given um, that they still have the same job or the same income, um, I think we need to look at encouraging the gig economy. Um, measures like AB5, which I th the, the, uh, uh, was passed at the state level, need to be addressed in Lake County um, and need to be opposed in Lake County because I think we are a wonderful opportunity and, and location for the gig economy to thrive and unfortunately AB5 is, is somewhat contrary to that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> final call for more questions, please. Um, I have one more question that was predetermined and now I just got another. Um, does anyone else want to submit a question? All right, thank you. Um, this will be Julia first. What are your thoughts in preserving and protecting our aquifers? Well, we die within about three days without a good source of water. I would say that it's absolute 100% priority. We have to have a good source of drinking water. Um, the fact that we actually have a spigot available to us on the mountain where we can go and get fresh water is incredible. And it's one of the great benefits of this county. I'd like to see more springs open to the public um, for, for public use. Um, and those springs need to protect it and the aquifers need to protect it. As far as the water level, um, we need to be considering at a planning level whether a new project that goes in will be a large water consumer. And uh, those who are not able to actually, I've already spoken about what I think about those who are sold lots and are no, no longer able to, to build on them because of water um, access issues. Thank you. Moke. Yeah. Well, just to clarify, there's, all it is an access issue in Hidden Valley, being able to, it's a moratorium. There's plenty of water in the valley. That's why it's imperative that we get it lifted for the economic development. Each project that goes through the planning process is scrutinized for uh, water use. There's hydrological reports that need to be done, not only quality, but also quantity. Some of the new things that are being implemented, especially with the new industry cannabis that's being moved in. And eventually there will be a move by the state of California and others to make sure that we uh, do the studies that need to happen here. The one thing is we, we live in a great valley here. Obviously, there are some things that need to be done locally at the community, at the community level, but also at the county level. Look at our long-term sustainability. And those processes are set in place through the economic development opportunities, through the Planning Commission, through the Board of Supervisors, through our Water Resources Department, um, throughout Lake County. Uh, here in District 1, those are things that are looked at every time a project comes through. And uh, we'll keep following on along those and look at a long-term plan as we move forward with growth. Thank you. All right, one more submitted 
from uh, someone watching online. Uh, due to the amount of traffic accidents over Mount St. Helena, um, Highway 29, and the increasing traffic as commuters travel to and from work and home, one, does the Lake County Board of Supervisors have any plans to work with Napa County Board of Supervisors and Napa County Board of Supervisors and Caltrans to mitigate the highway, i.e. straightening, rerouting, et cetera? And two, if so, what is the forecasted time frame? And this would be Moak first. It's obviously, Mount St. Lena is out of our district. It is with Napa. Um, we're, that is District 4. Uh, most of our Caltrans work is done in District 1. Um, Long-term planning. Uh, you know, myself, obviously, I know that there is called the St. Lena Group or something on Facebook working through those issues. Currently, CHP and others work trying to keep the big rigs and other things coming over the mountain. But a long-term planning strategy for the highway um, is something we conversate with at um, the South Deal Committee, which is a Caltrans committee that I set on. At this point, there are no long-term plans, but it also is a beautiful scenic drive. And keeping that scenic drive to who we are, I think is something we can look at. As far as commuters going over the mountain, I think we really look and work at that challenge, create jobs and opportunities to keep them here locally so they're not driving over the mountain every day like they do from 4.30 a.m. and 6 to 8 o'clock at night. Um, so at this point, uh, those issues, I think, are long-term, and we can bring those up. Thank you. Julia. Right, the accidents. Um, I think we've all heard the ambulances as they run up the mountain. And it's a tragedy. And it's a tragedy. We've probably all lost friends to the mountain. My experience in driving over the mountain for years is that I need to go slowly. And I think we need to encourage other people to go slowly. So having, I've actually never seen a law enforcement officer on the mountain slowing people down. And yet I see people behind me all the time, you know, bump, uh, you know, bumper or what do they call that? I mean, where they, they ride your bumper. Tailgating. And bump, tailgating, that's right, tailgating. And, uh, you know, really, people just need to slow down. It is, as Mo said, an absolutely beautiful drive, and you need to take it slowly. And um, also, I would like to say that, you know, what we really need to do in terms of long term planning at the county level is build an economy here so that people don't have to drive over the mountain. It's, it's wasteful, it's, it's you know, wasted a ton of fossil fuels to be driving over that mountain to work every day in Santa Rosa. So let's build the jobs here. Let's make it f feasible for people to remotely work in Lake County so that we can you know, make a living here and support ourselves here rather than having to drive over that mountain. I rather than trying to straighten out a road that just really is probably not ever gonna be straightened. I agree, I just said that. <laughs> okay, we have two questions left. Uh, and this one, um, I'm going to rephrase it somewhat, and hopefully the person who wrote it <clears throat> won't be offended by the way I'm going to rephrase it. Um, if, a, if a question or a project came before the supervisors, that is in direct conflict with your position on a particular interest of yours, be that personal or professional, would you, would you vote with the broad community interest in mind, or would you allow that personal conflict to take precedence. Does that make sense? Okay. So that one goes to Julia first. Okay. Um, I would say that if it was something in which my constituents, again, you know, you're, you're a representative. You're not just a representative of an individual. You're a representative <coughs> of the entire community. Um, I would say that if the community was in overwhelming support of something or overwhelmingly against something, I would simply vote with the community. And whether or not my, uh, I had a personal conflict with it. I might state my personal conflict at the supervisor's meeting to say that I felt as though this was not necessarily the right thing, but I could not deny the fact that my community was overwhelmingly in support of it. So 
I would vote with the community. Thank you. Moak. Well, I think the question is, can you vote if there's a conflict? And, and you can't. You need to recuse yourself. It is a misdemeanor. You can get in trouble. The rest of the Board of Supervisors could not even act on it. So if it's an issue that has uh, personal involvement with you where there's a conflict, you need to recuse yourself. Leave the room. You can't vote on that issue. It not only allows you not to vote on that issue, but the board may not even be able to vote on that issue if you continue uh, on with that. But um, I'll tell you right now, and legal counsel will let you know uh, when you're not doing something right. It is not a choice. It is a law. You will be in trouble as a supervisor. Conflicts of interest, I've already recused myself on different issues, and I've seen other boards of supervisor members recuse themselves on issues that they have a conflict with, and they leave the room. It happens all the time. You need to definitely state it and then leave the room. It's not a choice. You do not have a choice, and that's what you do. And I've done that. It's on film. You've watched in those issues. Even when there's a potential conflict, you make sure that you make it known, and then you do what you're supposed to do as an elected official. Thank you. Okay, can, I have, can I have a question? Uh, the question I would have, though, is if you're voting against your conflict, you're not voting. You can't vote. Well, the, then how can you represent your district? You can't represent your district in that instance. So who does? The rest of the board would have to. You never know what it may be. It may be a family member who has a you know, IHSS worker. It could, there's many different issues that you, you can't even contemplate some of the things that come up. There are rules and regulations, which you'll learn. Um, there are a lot of them. The Brown Act, ethical training and other things that really make you learn and understand how government works. Thank you. Um, several years ago, a supervisor was voted in, and she told me after she was voted in, this was a month or so afterwards, that she went to, as she called it, supervisor's training, supervisor's Absolutely. school, and the biggest thing she learned was how many things she couldn't do. So that gives you an idea. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going. I'm going to ask this question, and then uh, Julia and Moke have the opportunity to ask a question of each other. All right. The final question from uh, from the audience is: What is your vision for updating our area plans? Why is that so important? Why do you believe they are so out of date? And this would be, now I got lost. Okay, that would be uh, Moak first. Well, I can't answer uh, why they're out of date. So the oldest area plan, which is Lower Lake, which is 1988. I have an idea why we relate, because once you get on the board, there are a lot of different things. You're pulled in a million different directions of how you're moving forward. But one thing I've done as a board of supervisors is fight hard for Lower Lake. That is going to be the first area plan that needs to be updated. And then we're going to work through the process to update all area plans. As we do that, we're going to bring in the newest one and hopefully integrate some of that stuff. I'm proud to say the Milltown area plan is a good start. I think the Clear Lake, North Shore, and other, other plans are good ideas. But we really need to work through those, starting with Lower Lake. And that will happen this year. That comes through community development and community involvement. So I'm excited how that, that opportunity is starting. But we got a lot of work to do. But I can't have uh, an answer of why they're so outdated, but I do understand how it could happen. You can get very business, very busy as a Board of Supervisor and looking at things, and um, this is something we're refocusing on. So I'm proud to say that the Lower Lake uh, plan will be updated this year, or at least started. Thank you. Thank you. Julia. Thank you. Um, well, my vision for updating the plans, um, certainly any plan that has, is pre-2015 needs to be updated. Um, we have a fundamental game change in Lake County as of the date of the Valley Fire. So anything that did not take that into account and the new planning and the new, the new um, arrangements for housing and for smaller housing into account needs to be taken into account. The other thing we need to be able to do is to create concentrated housing facilities. And I'm not really talking about a Hidden Valley type subdivision. I'm talking about something that would be more like a land-based community where housing is co very concentrated, very defensible, with large you know, spaces around it which fire wouldn't penetrate in, and that it's made of materials that are uh, fireproof. And also so that the um, 
you know, there are certain economies that can be had, for instance, in cooking arrangements or in uh, working arrangements that could be had within the communities. Um, so these, this is a, a slightly different idea. I call this a land-based community, and there needs to be um, some way of accommodating land-based communities in Lake County. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to thank everyone who has come, who has attended uh, both here in person and watching the live stream and um, your attention and your consideration for your community is so important um, and I, I said something in something I wrote not too long ago you know we're here for district one Monday night we did district four and a week from tomorrow night we'll do district five as far as candidate forums go and what I realized a long time ago is it doesn't matter what district you live in. The people that you vote to represent your district are one of five. And whoever you elect impacts all of Lake County because they must collaborate, they must look beyond, in some cases, their own district. They have to look at the greater good for everybody. So, um, pardon me for editorializing on my own behalf. Um, I would like to thank Calpine Corporation, Danielle, for making the facility available. <laughs> Sam Houston for taking care of video and sound. And I'd like to thank our board of directors who are in attendance here this evening. Uh, because we are the Lake County Board of, uh, excuse me, Lake County Chamber of Commerce, we do reach out to all communities around Lake County for representatives on our board of directors. So we have Joe Castile, our president, who's hiding in the corner over there. Ariel Carmona, who's right here writing notes for the record B. A new member on our board, Matt Metcalf from Greenview Restaurant. Lisa Wilson from Clear Lake Campground. Bobby Dutcher, real estate, former logging guy. And Chuck Saberna with West Coast Fire, who supplied our pads tonight for the questions since I neglected to bring the 3 by 5 cards. I'd like to thank Supervisor Simon and Julia Bono for coming tonight, participating, and all of you for your time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. I'm sorry. What? question each other. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I forgot. Oh. <laughs> I was just reminded that I forgot something. Um, I had said that um, at the end, the super, um, our candidates would ask each other a question. So, Julia, would you like to pose your question to Mo? Thank you for the reminder. Well, I had a really yes. good question, but you may have already answered it, Mo. So, um, this is the question, and you know, please uh, reiterate your, your response. Um, we talked about conflicts earlier, and as a supervisor, um, have you ever voted in a way that conflicts with the special interests of your Native American community of which you're a leader? I can answer that clearly. Absolutely not. Um, if you've watched me at the Board of Supervisors and everything, I do not report on my other opportunities. Um, you know, I, I represent the tribal nation when I'm on tribal land. Uh, I represent the county when I sit in that seat. And I've done that. If there were questions in the past, hopefully I've answered them. You know, obviously I'm a tribal member of the Middletown Rancheria. You know, it's a proud heritage that I hold. But when I sit in the county seat, I recuse myself from any issues that come up. I make sure to check with county council and I protect myself all the times and I protect the community. Um, so yeah, I, I do exactly what's expected of me. And it's simple. I have two hats, but as you know me, I am a tribal leader when I am doing that, and when I'm a county supervisor, that is the thing that I do. And I've done that. It's on film, and not only at the Board of Supervisors, other, in, in other instances, LAFCO, uh, Lake Transit Authority Area Planning Council, any of the others. 
I follow the rules. You give me the rules, I follow them, but I always want to build respect uh, for what I do. I said I'd be available, I'd represent this community, I've stepped up and done that, and ethically I've done what I needed to do. So you wouldn't be allowed to represent the county, you wouldn't be allowed to represent the district in a, a situation where, where you had a conflict with the Native American community? That's what answer. I just said. No, no, no. I think, I think the issue that I'm trying to bring up is that he needs to step off the board entirely. Is that correct? He That's need, what everybody no, does. No, I understand that. And, and ethically, he's doing that. But that he then cannot represent our district on the board because there's no one to back him up. So if there is a conflict of That happens of to every supervisor who has a conflict. Well, it's just that you do have this conflict. And, I don't have and a that conflict. Is, Julia, and that is the issue. Absolutely yeah. not. He, he did answer your question, and it goes across to all, all five districts. And it isn't that they're not representing their district. They are living by the rules that are set forth um, that says they must recuse themselves. So I, we, he did answer I'm, your question. I feel question. as though my point's not being made. May I well, take a moment to make it again? Moak needs to ask his question of you. Well, that's fine, but you, you, you're misunderstanding my point. No, no, I'm not. Okay, thank you. Um, Moak, would you ask your question of Julia, please? Ooh, that, that's a very good one. Um, yeah, you know, my question to you would be, um, I know you said you've been here 20 years, and um, what I would like to know is, what you've done in your 20 years here to improve the lives in the community of each one of these people and constituents in the room? Well, I've served as a wedding minister. I have served as a community organizer. I have uh, organized fundraisers for things like um, starting the uh, children's playground at the uh, uh, Lion Center in Central Park. Um, one of the first things I did, I organized, uh, I ran a business. I probably served many of you at my restaurant that I ran for several years. What was the name of your restaurant? It was called Back to the Garden. It was on Bush Street um, behind Tri-Counties Bank. In your home? Yes, it was certified by the county. So if... Um, as far as, uh, I've also contributed to the community in terms of um, spending money here. I've been a client. I've done my, after I had uh, uh, closed my open door business, oh, I also worked as a computer technician. I may have worked on some of your computers. Um, having a very high degree of uh, ability with technology has been uh, a great uh, opportunity for me um, to serve the community. Um, and that's one thing I intend to bring to the Board of Supervisors, is the use of technology whenever possible to make things more efficient for us. And because I already have a high, highly technical background, I'm a scientist, um, I'm a computer technician, um, you know, these, are, these are things that I intend to bring to bear uh, as a supervisor. Thank you. Now we have the closing statements. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and at this point, um, Julia will go first with her closing statement, two minutes, and then Moak. Well, I want to thank every one of you for being here, first of all. Um, I think it's extremely important that our community gets a chance to meet those who, are, uh, who have the desire to represent the community. I think it's very important that um, people have the opportunity to express their issues and to air their grievances and to ask their questions. Um, I will be calling probably every one of you in this room that has a phone number on register with the registrar's office to talk to you personally. I want to know what you think. I want to know what your ideas are. I want to represent you. Not necessarily, I'm just one person. I want to represent the other 9,700 members of District 1. The, I have no conflict of interest with due to my small community. I want to make it clear that I do not have a conflict of interest. I will not need to step down from the board when you need something voted on for Middletown. Okay, I do not have that conflict of interest. And as much as I respect and I desire the uh, Native American community in our area to have uh, a say in local politics, I think that they should not do so in a way that is con conflicted for the rest of the county, the rest of the 9,000 members of the county. Okay. 
was that. So in conclusion, um, I would recommend that you, if you're interested in knowing uh, more details about me, if you haven't met me yet, that you contact me via my website. It's bono4supervisor.com. I have a complete uh, outline of my background. I have my platform and the items of order uh, and, and interest that I am particularly committed to. So um, if you have particular items that are of interest to you, please message me. I would like to hear what you have to say. When I do call, I would very much like to sit down and have a conversation with you about your interests and your concerns. Thank you. No. My name is Moke Simon. I'm running for re election as District 1 Supervisor. If you don't know me and understand the passion that I have for this community, come and talk to me. I'm running for re election because I know where we need to go as a county. I've worked hard. I've lived here. I've grown here, grown up here with my family, uh, my wife Nancy, who sits here, my daughter in the back, Teresa. But I know most of you all of my lives. I'm trying to take this community in a great direction. I'm all inclusive. You know, the tribal nations are just as important as anybody else. I went through this conflict of interest thing in the previous race, and, you know, and basically you're one step away from racism as far as I'm concerned. And I have to deal with that all the time. And, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. No supervisor can stand up here and say they will not be conflicted because you never know what issues are going to come to the board. You may have something right next to your neighborhood, opportunities, church, church issues, anything. You never know what's going to come up. When I ran for office, I said I'd be available. I'd work hard to make this place a better place for everyone. I'm inclusive about that, and I want to make a bright economic development future here. You know, I can stand around and, and talk a lot, as you guys know, but I also get out there in the community and really try and put myself out there for action, not just words. And I'm proud of all the things I've accomplished, being the first one appointed to a governor's seat on the State Board of Fire Services, representing all 58 counties. The other thing is making sure that Lake County is noticed. It doesn't matter what building I walk into, I'm representing Lake County as a whole. Everyone, from every constituent to every tribal nation, anybody that lives in Lake County, we are going to make this place a better place. And we're gonna do that in coordination and collaboration with each and every one in this room. I see elected officials, people from the Homeowners Association, and just community members are gonna help me do that. I can't do it alone, but I love to put everybody on my back and carry him across the finish line. And that's what I plan on doing. Please vote for vote. Thank you very much. Thank you again for our co-sponsors for this evening and for your attention. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the 2020 edition of the Destination Magazine and Claude Brown with Westgate Petroleum is very generous in storing the inventory, and um, he was gracious enough to bring two boxes tonight for Danielle. And if you all, if you take all of them when you leave tonight, it's okay because we'll get her more. So, thank you very, very much on behalf of the uh, of Calpine Mama and the Lake County Chamber.